Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the John Edwin Morris Global Leadership Institute inaugural convening there. I have it all out. Take two, right? Day two. I have the privilege of having some just absolutely outstanding colleagues here. You'll see our chairs and directors and faculty members as their schedules allow coming in and out of meetings. Malta Pale, the Director of International Studies, has been here regularly. I appreciate that support and Malta, thanks for your great work. He is sitting next to Scott Harris, the Director of Archaeology back there because, you know, it also is one of the most international disciplines actually in terms of its operational capacities across the board. We have here the Emeritus Dean of the School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs, as you know, David Cohen. And he deserves a lot. Look, the library here and where it's at now owes a lot to David Cohen. And that should not be overlooked. And so, David, thank you for your good work. Now, we also are privileged here to have um, this group here that's going to form the panelists for the EWI History Project. And um, you'll see John White's name up there. You'll see his full pro profile in the speaking list. Um, John is, just by happenstance, one of the best digital archivists in the country. <laughs> and it was very good to be able to pick up the phone and be able to say this when we were talking about the EWI gifting. John, there are archives. <laughs> there are archives. And to be assured of the confidence I, we have in John and his work, because in the course of that, those conversations, John reminded me, he said, this is an organization in which a lot of their work was not written, it was communication. And so oral history has to be part of this. And that was John's idea, and it continues to be John's major contribution here. Now, and we start talking archives, we start talking about longevity with the organization. And of course, Karen Linehan Morose has been just absolutely key to that. We have been talking also with some of you and will continue to talk to some of you. And then sitting beside Karen, as you know, is Emily Whalen, who is a really outstanding historian and into geopolitics and has been a real support and is a consultant on the History Project so I would like to turn it over to them now and they will be able to show you what they've done. I will say that this is a long-term project, okay? This is not something that happens just overnight, and, um, but it will be a very valuable asset for not just the college, but as it's put online and more access is opened up, it'll be a great research center and source internationally. So, John? Thank you, Tim, and thank you for the introduction. We're really happy to be here today. Uh, this is probably a little bit different than all of the other sessions that you're all attending in that you know, this one's dealing with the nuts and bolts of how we are going to be able to preserve not just the history of the East-West Institute, but also to capture the memories of everyone who was involved in it. And as many of you are well aware, that's a pretty lengthy list of folks that can sometimes be hard to track down uh, since they're traveling all over the world and very busy, important people. We were, as Tim said, one of the things that struck me immediately when we began talking about this project was the fact that you know, this is an organization that was largely built around personal relationships, around conversations, around the interactions between people from all over the world. It also became apparent when we began talking with some of the staff at EWI that many of those things just simply were not going to be captured in memos intentionally. I mean, some people didn't want there to be a record of conversations and things they were having. 
but also just as a historian and archivist, the, it's, I could not ignore the power of people telling their own stories, of having some agency over their, you know, their own history. And I'm gonna play a, an audio clip here that many of you may recognize, and I think the reason we wanted to play this was to drive home exactly what we're trying to capture here and the power of hearing someone tell their story in their own voice of the organization and of the work they did. What we're saying is that we're trying to identify the critical elements of the EWI process. One of them is called trust. It has three major components. Part one is, is interpersonal, building that interpersonal basic level of trust. The second level is, is once you've done that and the person has begun to begin to believe that you can help do something, and then you have to actually carry out, you got, you got to, there's deliverables. You got, you, you got to be in action place. You got to be deliverables. You got to do real things. That strengthens that core trust, makes the person go further. He then goes to, he or she then goes to other people. They, they intend. You know, you know, brings you into their network. The network is that's a network of trust, personal networks and networks of trust. That then leads you to get to other people and other things happen. And all of that in turn goes to, can be then taken into a third level at a certain point in time, you have the critical mass to be able to start really focusing on how do you build strategic trust, which is the highest level of trust among the nations, among those who govern, among institutions, those who, those who govern. So, so the trust piece would be element one of the, uh, it is a core competency. It's a set of core competencies, but I, I think, I don't know how you put that, but, yeah. but it definitely, it definitely is uh, one of the elements. It's the first and core element of the EWI. What we're saying is that we're trying. So that of course was John Moroz, the co-founder of EWI. Uh, and we were lucky enough that Karen was able to find that clip for us so we could actually hear from the founder. Uh, I'm sure for many of you that was a real blast from the past and for our students, you know, I think hopefully that was a, a taste of what you will be able to find in this project over time, not just hearing from the co-founder, but of everyone who was involved in the organization. So I wanted to give a brief update on sort of the work that we have done so far to capture this history and let you know the work that we still have to do. Uh, we, of course, took possession of the archives. Uh, they've been transferred to the College of Charleston. They have been cataloged and are available for research now. Um, we uh, also acquired you know, several terabytes of audio video files and photographs that we're working our way through. And we have published, there's an entire EWI library, and we have an EWI library page you know, with the site that has more than 170 publications from the organization that have been cataloged and are available in our library. This summer, we're gonna begin the process of digitizing those publications where they'll be available to anyone, anywhere to use. And we're also going to continue with the oral history project. In order to do that, we had to first spend the last year building an entire system to hold these things. Uh, if you know anything about libraries or you've managed your own website, I just would ask all of you to think about the photos on your phone and what a terrible job you are all doing of organizing them, describing them, <laughs> keeping track of them, knowing who's in them, or deleting the ones that you will never look at again. Um, unfortunately, an archive or library can't afford to do that, and we need to have good descriptive metadata for all of these collections, um, and we, we also need to know what are the important things, you know, what are the good subject headings, who are the right people, which is how we were introduced to Emily Whalen. Um, Emily is an exceptional scholar. Uh, she's probably the expert in the world on the history of EWI, and although we had a lot of knowledge about how we were going to go about the project and how to collect oral histories, and more importantly, how to catalog them and make them available, the one thing none of us did know, uh, you know was, well, who should we be talking to? Uh, so Emily's been really critical in not only helping us figure out a way to, to come up with the list of where to start, but to come up with the questions. And in order to do that, she, she did um, a little pilot project for us to begin testing out our system with Karen. So I'm going to play a clip from that interview now. Uh. One of the things that I thought was really brilliant about the way that he approached this was he felt that to get to the influencer and potential influencer of a leader um, was far more important than the leader itself. 
uh, and maybe, um, you know, rather than, than foreign ministers, or they were all part of it, but they weren't part of the day-to-day -day activity. And that bringing these people together and creating a network and a family, because for John, family took on two parts. There was the fa professional family, but there was the family of the professionals. And they were always included, whether it was speakers coming or whether it was um, the um, actual fellows or, or, or whoever it was that came on board from outside the States. So um, it, we, one of the things that I thought. So I think you're starting to get an idea of what we're working for here that there are thousands of people who have had some interaction with the organization over its many years. There are hundreds of people who have been actually involved in the organization itself. And there are more stories than we will ever be able to capture. Beyond that, we then have to capture the legacy of those people and the people that they influenced. Uh, and all of this is a pretty labor intensive process. Again, I want to remind you of how disorganized the photos are on your phone and remind, and remind you that we cannot do that when it comes to research. And for those of you who will be looking into the history of the organization, for those of you who need to go back and look at this work, you need to be able to find it. So this is just a short, this is actually a dr dramatic oversimplification of the process we're going through of, a, of having these oral histories. Just as I mentioned, it took about five of us to just begin identifying the interviewees. Um, and then recording and producing transcripts, making sure that the entire website is ADA compliant for people with disabilities, uploading into a system that is sustainable and interoperable with other library systems. It's, uh, it's an enormous amount of work. Uh, just to do this video with our friend Hilton Smith uh, involved a team of about seven people, um, not including Hilton. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and I know it doesn't surprise anyone that it took seven people to handle Hilton, but it's, uh, but most of that was in the descriptive work, videoing all, all of the you know, work that it takes to make this accessible because again, people aren't going to just one website. You want people to find these by way of subject headings and other descriptive metadata. It is our hope that moving forward, most of these interviews are video. And we're, we did this really as a pilot project to start working on some equipment, to find out some equipment needs. You know, we have some hopes of moving beyond the C-SPAN look into something a little higher production values over time. But, you know, again, um, you can search. And we found this clip by going in, in, in the record in the oral history system. You can actually go to a certain point based on subject headings to find, you know, what Hilton's talking about. man who uh, wanted to be, he, his goal was to be a professor. He wanted to be a, a teacher in college and teach this stuff. But, um, I want to start humble, it over here. See if we can. humble man who uh, wanted to be, he, his goal was to be a professor. He wanted to be a, a teacher in college and teach this stuff. But um, he, ran into opportunities, uh, and when he was writing his PhD, I forget which school it was, but he was writing a PhD on international peace and the challenges that it was facing across the world. Um, so if you go to the actual website, I promise it actually works, but, um, and, and everything's synced up, but that goes to show you just how complicated this can be because we have to make sure that it works on every browser, every computer, uh, and then that we have a system for moving that from one system to the next. So, uh, you, so we have the interview team, we have an, an AV team that comes and records these materials and prepares the video, and then the digital library team, which makes it available beyond that. Um, these are not small groups of people. You know, these are a number of our faculty members who are going to have to do these interviews, some over Zoom, some in person. Uh, not some not at the College of Charleston, there may be some travel involved, and it'll be a combination of various audio and video interviews. We also are dealing at times with sensitive subjects, so we have to have a system in place where some of these folks may not want to give an interview and have that be immediately available. So we have to have a system for that in place and for tracking that to know if there's some type of time restriction on an interview, um, if, you know, 15 years from now when I'm retired, somebody needs to, that system needs to be there where it's not just my memory that we can't make this accessible yet. We need to know that in the systems. There's a whole back end of this oral history project that tracks that work. 
Um, again, it takes a number of people to set up the lighting, the camera work, and then the digital library team. And you can see a clip here. This is actually what the East West Institute library page looks like with all of their publications. And uh, as we begin digitizing these, you'll actually be able to just access the entire book, the entire article, the entire pamphlet um, you know, a as we're working on it. We currently have um, about uh, 180 or so. Yes, it was 170 on the slide, but I think we're up to 180 now, publications cataloged and available. The archive is available for research, and we've loaded our first two oral histories. Our friend Dr. Whalen conducted two oral histories yesterday, and we have some lined up, really, for the entire summer. So this project is sort of endless. Um, but I did want to ask our panelists, and I'll start with, with you, Dr. Whalen. Um, if you can tell us just a little bit, you know, I mean, what, about sort of the reason we're collecting these things, uh, about, tell us about your experience studying the history and legacy of EWI, you know, first as an independent scholar when you were working on the book. Yeah, um, I, uh, so I, first off, I wanted to just thank you all for, um, for convening this, um, this wonderful conference and for establishing this project, because I, I think that it's um, incredibly important. Uh, so for a little bit of background, I started writing um, a book about the history of the East-West Institute while I was finishing my doctoral work. So I did it in addition to my dissertation, which was an interesting choice. Um, but uh, I would say that um, it was a, an incredible challenge and an incredible opportunity. And studying the history of the East-West Institute really gave me a different perspective on international history in the last 40, 50 years that was integral to my development as a scholar. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about those intellectual frames. But to speak about the history of the Institute, um, I really have to thank Karen and um, the members of the board of the East West Institute, particularly Bob Campbell, who were so supportive of this project and really let me um, position the history of the East West Institute, not just as an institutional history, but actually as something that my, my colleague Hal Brands, who has read the book, uh, called it a case study in geopolitical strategy um, in the last 40 years. So looking at the end of the Cold War and looking into the first sort of spasmodic era of globalization and seeing um, through the lens of the East West Institute really some new stories about the world around us today. So it was an incredible opportunity. Um, that said, you know, having worked a little bit with the, uh, with the EWI History Project here at the College of Charleston, I would say the difference is really, it's, um, you know, I was picking out a melody sort of on a, on a play keyboard, and this is really like playing a symphony with an entire orchestra behind you. Um, the EWI History Project here, it lets the book, um, when it's eventually published, become not just sort of the last word on EWI, but really the start and the center of a new conversation. And um, I think as scholars, we often have to be reminded of this and perhaps also in our political discourse today, you know, we don't wanna have the last word on a subject. We wanna be having a conversation. And so um, I really see this as expanding the scope and scale of the impact of the book and, um, and really contributing, I think, to some important scholarship in the future. There are other oral history archives um, similar to what I envisioned the EWI oral history archive looking like. At Yale, there is um, a UN oral history archive. The American Diplomatic Association also has, um, carries on oral history archival projects for departing foreign service officers. And what the EWI project has the potential to do is to capture the important stories of international history that are not um, encompassed under the umbrellas of those sort of more official organizations. It really gets at the texture of what um, what I call international society, which are the um, the individuals and institutions that are um, that constitute the connective tissue of the international system. So, so given that your know, rich history, the complicated history of the organization, and what recommendations? I know you've shared some of these with me, but I, these folks haven't heard it. Uh, you know, what recommend, recommendations do you have for the new institute, and, and particularly in the larger um, you know, idea of the institute, dealing with students, with instruction, with internships and other things, how do you see then an oral history project playing into that? I mean, how are we going to bring the sort of legacy project together with the ongoing work of the Global, global Leadership Institute? Sure, yeah, it's a, um, a great question and a dangerous one to ask a historian. Uh, but I think the, for me, it comes down to stories. You know, we understand the world through stories and we're experiencing a moment in global history where the stories that we've learned about the world around us really aren't quite fitting the reality of what we're seeing. We're coming up against this seam 
of ourselves as observers of history and as subjects of history. So I think that, um, you know, in terms of how I look at the, um, the Oral History Project and, of course, the, the Moroz Institute as well, is coming back to that idea of international society. You know, something I learned when I was writing the history of EWI is that, you know, all due respect to, uh, to John Mearsheimer, but foreign policy isn't a chess game or a billiards game. It's really an ecosystem. And um, one of the things that I think we're struggling with in our present moment is that this ecosystem is really becoming atomized and is becoming sort of separated and disjointed. And I see the Rose Institute and the Archives Project um, as a way of capturing and furthering the story of the connective tissue of the foreign policy ecosystem. So um, I, I think in terms of, you know, in terms of public function, universities in America always have a public function. And uh, so it's really bringing Charleston into international society, training students to become members of international society, and then also serving as a repository of information about the history of international society. Um, and in that way, kind of, again, preserving and uh, recording and continuing the story of, um, of the international system. So, yeah. Thank you. So, so Karen, we just played a clip from, from your interview, which I think was we were describing as a preliminary test interview. I know Emily wants to do one that's a little more involved and hopefully on video. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and why you thought it was important um, to record your recollections for the project? Sure. Um, I have to start with two bits of comedy. Uh, this morning I talked to my seven-year-old granddaughter and she said, where are you? I said, well, I'm in Charleston. That's about six hours south of us. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm at the College of Charleston. She said, oh, are you at grandma school? I said, yeah, I think I am at grandma school today. <laughs> and then I knew I was overtired yesterday when I encouraged somebody to please do an oral history. It's so important to do your living will with Emily. I thought from a trust in the states background, no, Karen, not your living will. So, um, so if I said that to you, disregard it. It's the oral history that we want you to <laughs> want to do a living will. That's up to you. Um, I think the, uh, the, the real importance of it is to capture what was there. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to see and recommend in coming to the college was a place to not just archive, with all due deference to John, but to make it um, a, a living archive so that it inspired students and trained the next generation. It's very important to me. Someone said in the original um, discussions, what about scholarship? And I'm all for scholarships, but in this case, it was let's have the curriculum, the material to inspire um, uh, students and those who are coming to look at what made this a successful institute. I have had so many emails about Ukraine and Russia. What would John be doing? What do, what do you think would happen? I don't really know the answer, but I can I have a few ideas on it. Uh, and I think it's so important to be able to capture those uh, moments. If I might, I wanted to share something with you. 20 years ago, we had, uh, with the funding of George Russell, a wonderful document called 20 Stories um, for 20 Years. And it captured um, short stories from individuals who were involved in the first 20 years of the Institute. And it's so important, and I think, to hear it at this time because it kind of, I hope, will inspire those who are thinking about signing up and doing this. Um, and one came from Larry, they all had an opening quote. One came from Larry Eagleburger, who some of us old folks will remember, was uh, <clears throat> former U.S. Secretary of State, and said, who are you really, John Rose? A question I've been asked for 50 years. Um, I couldn't believe how much tenacity and zeal um, he, John Rose, and his colleagues had back in the early 80s. They just didn't know the meaning of the word no. For those who know John, they understand that. Uh, but the more we listened to them and watched them, what they were doing, the more it became obvious that this new institute just might make a difference, and it has. And then one um, from Polly Neville Jones, who was the Foreign and Community Office in London and later went on to lead the BBC, um, talked about in the, uh, those days of the Cold War, throughout, uh, thought, I thought, Polly Neville Jones thought, um, EWI was a pioneering endeavor with a moderate chance of success at best. The Institute was trying to engage the East in a dialogue and not confine it to innocuous subjects. This was key to breaking down the barriers, cultivating human contacts, and getting individuals on both sides engaged. It was the only Institute trying to do this on a multi-level basis. And I think, to me, those are inspiring because all of you have stories. We may not be Pauline Neville Jones or Larry Eagleburger, but we have the, uh, the other side of diplomacy, which is so important to share with students. Uh, and one that I thought was particularly 
um, uh, relevant to today, if I can find it, was, um, yes, the Institute for East West Studies <clears throat> has seriously contributed to the process of constitution building in Ukraine, right at the most critical point of constitution debate in my country. And that came from a member of the Ukrainian parliament at the time. So this was wonderful ca for capturing years one through 20. We particularly need to capture years 20 through 40. Um, and as small as you think your, your story, um, the other side of diplomacy, as I'm calling it, the backroom stories or the interactions to remind us of the many things that we did, um, I think that's really critical. And I would challenge the college. Um, someone said, John will be with you this morning. I said, no, he shut the mic off. Um, but it, it's challenge the college was, I heard the students standing here and I've heard other students say, I'm majoring in X, Y, Z. I would someday love us to sit here and hear, I'm majoring in X, Y, Z, and I'm minoring in the study of global leadership. Because I think we have the raw material and the data, and through John's work and Emily's work, we'll have that. So that if you look around and you look at global leadership, you look at leadership, it's executive leadership, leading an organization, and those are all wonderful, important things. But who's studying the global leaders? Who's looking at that spice or recipe that the East-West Institute had of building strategic trust and strategic partnerships and networking? Looking for the person who's the next influencer. John didn't look for the foreign minister. He looked for who had the ear of the foreign minister. He was a doctor who diagnosed a problem, prescribed what the necessary medication was, brought in the right consultants to enhance it. And that's what we're trying to capture. We need your help and letting us know what the spice was as you saw it, or what the recipe was, or the experience. So it's, it's critical to have your input, because I remember a lot of the stories, but I don't quite remember them the way others who had more of a particular role in it. So it's a long-winded answer to your question, but that I wouldn't be me without that. So, so Emily, when you were working on the book, you had to try to track down all kinds of folks to talk with, and I'm curious, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how important it was. I mean, you mentioned the conversations you had with Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you could tell us how important it was to actually speak with these people and what you uncovered in the book, that you simply would never have been, it never would have been accessible to you re reading any memo publication or anything that someone wrote down, uh, even if they kept it, deposited it somewhere where you could have access to it and it was preserved. W what types of stories were you able to find um, yeah. through way of interviewing people? That's a great question, and I think uh, I'm laughing because I'm sure the folks who are in the audience who I did interview are, you know, uh, remembering me as a graduate student running around breathless and um, just scribbling things down in my terrible handwriting. Uh, so I think I think about this in two ways, um, and sort of echoing a little bit of what Karen just said. One is that I found out who I needed to talk to by talking to people. Um, so Karen and um, many members of the board were really critical in offering me suggestions of who to talk to. And then my last question in an interview is always, you know, preview for those of you who are um, gonna participate in the Oral History Project, is always, who else should I be talking to? Um, and that's how you can kind of rebuild those, uh, those personal networks, which do not get captured in the archive. When you're a historian, the first thing you learn is all of the things that don't get captured um, in, in you know, written memos and in historical archives. That's the beauty of an oral history project is that you can get some of the, the texture, the emotion, the atmosphere um, that constitutes really um, sort of the, the spice, the juice. Um, so uh, it was, as I said, a challenging experience doing this alone. Um, I was only able to do it because I could ask folks to, to you know, introduce me to other folks. And, um, and you know, to be able to replicate that on a broader scale with the history project is, is going to be really critical. Um, and I would say also, it, you know, talking to people is really what brought me not just the history of EWI, but then also thinking about the context of EWI. And I've mentioned a few times, you know, the role that EWI played in world history. And, um, you know, I think for the span of the Institute's lifetime from 19, you know, roughly 1980 to, um, or, you know, lifetime as an independent institute, I should say, uh, to about 2020, that was a transformational period in global history, really transformational. And um, so hearing about folks' experience, not just with EWI, but also their own experience of living that history has been um, really illustrative of the, the role the Institute played and the, its importance. You know, it, even yesterday, speaking with Basil Hudak, who was um, with the Institute in the 1990s, he also told us about his experience as um, 
uh, you know, a young man doing his military service in Czechoslovakia during the Velvet Revolution. It's an incredible story, and we were able to capture that as well, and also see how that shaped his experience with EWI. So this is, um, it starts with EWI, and it has many, many um, sort of broad ripple effects out beyond it. Does that answer your question? Yes. So one of the things we really pride ourselves on here at the College of Charleston is the ability for our students to engage in, you know, faculty student research, to engage in serious professional research uh, with members of our faculty. It is a, an area of distinction. Uh, and the faculty who are, who are on the interview team, you know, one of their goals is to you know, have many of these interviews at least you know, performed or, or you know, as a unit with students, to engage students with uh, you know, various people who, who played a role in the history of EWI, you know, who are continuing its legacy. Uh, from a sort of putting on your professor hat rather than your author hat or historian hat, I mean, what, what values do you see in sort of undergraduates being able to learn these same lessons that you learned as part of their undergraduate experience and research experience in the Glo Global Leadership Institute? That's a great question. Um, also dangerous to ask me to put on my professor hat. Uh, <laughs> so I think, um, you know, this was something that we, I think, came up in a lot of the sessions uh, yesterday, which is the, the how to listen. I have to, I write notes when I'm, um, when I'm interviewing folks and I often have to write a little note to myself to shut up. Um, so, to, you know, just to listen, to hear people talk and to um, allow them to tell you their own stories, as you mentioned in the beginning of this. Um, and that's, you know, I think learning to listen to people's stories is a really invaluable, um, it's a really invaluable skill to learn, particularly as an undergraduate. So there's that, you know, important soft skill. And then I would say also, um, you know, this is a little bit of me as a professor and of me as an author, uh, my own experience having conversations about the East-West Institute really changed how I saw the world. And it really gave me um, a new perspective on the international system. And I, I think that it's incredibly educational to speak to people who have firsthand experience of, of, um, of these changes and of the world. And um, that's just, you know, that's gold. It can, it can really change the trajectory of what you're thinking about for your life. It can populate your imagination about what the future holds. And I think will be a um, really significant pedagogical asset for the College of Charleston. Can I add something yes. that, I think something that Emily said is very important. Um, when uh, I got some beautiful letters from all over the world uh, when John passed in 2014, and there was a, a, a constant theme in it that I thought was so interesting. Uh, not because I didn't think he was a good listener, but a lot of wives don't think that of their husbands or spouses. But we won't get into that today. Uh, but there was a constant theme as John was an outstanding listener. And of course, if you're going to be a doctor, um, as I've sort of described his methodology, you have to be a good listener. You have to listen for every single clue as to what is the disease, the element of the disease. How are you going to diagnose it? What are you going to prescribe as, as what's coming on? And um, it, he was an extraordinary listener. Uh, and I think that's something that if you are looking at the qualities of global leadership through examination of John Rose as uh, one who applied unique entrepreneurial leadership skills, to global situations, you have to see that as a really critical part in life. Uh, and I think it's um, uh, very important. I ran for a number of years with, when I was with the Goldman Sachs Foundation, a program for, we used to call it Goldman Sachs Leadership Institute. And um, it was for rising sophomores and they competed globally and we brought them to New York for a week and we would put on um, a, a university setting where we would bring in uh, top leaders, Kofi Annan, I had Ryan, uh, Louder, head of Louder Foundation, I had head, captains of industry and uh, leaders in diplomacy come in, and I always used to cue them in and say, look, these kids want your seat and half the time you got there. And they know how already. And the applications would come in, I'm preparing in the following way to become the President of the United States. I would say, okay. <laughs> uh, and, um, but that's what they were hungry for is, how did you do this, you know? How did you get here? And, and he was referred to as a young Turk, and he would always listen to um, what it was that um, uh, someone was, was putting before him. Um, he would travel with, and his staff knows this, tons, everything but the kitchen sink, but take notes, constantly taking notes. And I would say, do you ever go back and read all those notes? <laughs> of course, of course. But he was very kinesthetic in his approach, and I think that's what you want to learn as, as a student is, how did he see this? You know, what what did he do? What did he take? 
uh, I always used to kid him because he refers to his grandmother as a great source from Poland, emigrating to this country at the age of um, 14 or so, uh, coming with nothing, but is the only young person in the village in her Krakowian-like costume, sent to the United States to pick up gold on the streets and then go back in three days to Poland and make it a wealthy village. Well, that didn't happen, and she ended up becoming one of the famous Lowell girls in the textile industry. She was a huge influence on, on him and asked questions that many we heard yesterday from some of the leaders of industry who came to you. Uh, he was born on May 1st, and I always used to say, um, did you think all those Kremlin parades were in your honor? <laughs> well, maybe for a certain amount of age. But uh, I think that, you know, he considered himself a proud American, but he was more a global citizen. So that's what we want to capture is those stories. You know, how, how did you see him and how can we teach the next generation? What are some of the things that you can think about in your preparation for whatever you want to go into? Whether you want to lead Medicine Sans, uh, the, the global doctors program, whether you want to do uh, relief for refugees, whether you want to lead a country, whether you want to lead uh, in, in whatever government service, et cetera, that you do. Um, what are the key factors that you can learn from this individual that would make your career and enhance who you are? And, you know, look at Zelensky, a comedian, an actor. What prepared that man to become a global uh, leader in the way that he has? What are those key elements? How can you look at global leadership? So. Thank you. So I wanted to point out while you're all here, uh, you know, we're still beta testing essentially a, the site where we're going to deposit not just the oral histories that we're doing, but all of the audio video files. There are interviews and all kinds of things that EWI had in its possession that it transferred to the College of Charleston. Uh, you know, it took about a year to build this site because you have to build everything to sort of hold these things in a sustainable way where they're backed up safely. So when the next hurricane comes through and the computer that we had it on in the library gets water in it, we don't lose everything. Um, but you know, we're also using it to build essentially a platform for oral history more broadly. We have a number of other oral history projects on campus, a number of other projects that we're gonna have in this system, but we'll have you know, an entire library of EWI projects. The idea is that this will open up an experiential learning opportunity for our students in many different disciplines. And with this one being the real pilot, the one that we're gonna to use to have a cat, you know, be a catalyst for a larger project across the curriculum on campus. Um, but I wanted to point out, you know, just some of the, you know, everything that we do will have a full transcript so that it's all accessible. You can access the transcript. You can actually then, um, and what I like about this because I have absolutely zero patience is, um, and I can read faster than I can listen to these things, is you can jump at any point um, in the oral history interview to the area that you're re researching and jump to that clip, uh, whether it's an audio interview or a video interview. And you, many people we have found are more comfortable in audio than video. It's disarming. You forget the recorder's there. There's some real sort of reason why we may keep some of these uh, simply on, on audio. So, you know, I would hope that all of you, and we'll open things up for questions here in a minute, but I, anyone who's been involved in the organization uh, can come and talk to us afterwards. We really are going to try to send out a list. We want to encourage everyone to sign up to do one of these interviews with our faculty, with our students, with Dr. Whalen, our consultant. Um, you know, we're, I, I anticipate if we really want to talk to you and we haven't heard from you, um, that Karen will have no issues we'll tracking you, you down. We'll you, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that we can include your interview in, you know, in this larger project. And for our students, you know, again, we really want this to be an opportunity for students to learn. And I know that some of the faculty who at the college are already trying to recruit students to participate you know, in the project so that they can take part in this and record these types of interviews. Uh, in, in, you know, as a reminder, every time that you're watching these, you know, whether it's you know, whatever documentary you're watching on PBS or anywhere else, um, those interviews came from somewhere. You know, when they're doing an interview with someone who passed away 40 years ago and they have the audio clip or a video clip that was recorded somehow, somewhere, that means some, someone did it. They kept it, they saved it, they made it accessible in a way uh, so you're really doing work that will outlast all of our careers when you record these things. Um, 
you know, it's, uh, it was always fascinating to me working in our special collections at a, you know, 250 year old institution when people would get in a hurry to do things um, because you know, some of that stuff's been here for a couple hundred years. Next week's fine, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you don't tend to think anything in a hurry. Uh, and we want to do this in a way where we can collect it forever. And I hope, and, and I'll sort of give the last question to Karen and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. If we're successful in that and you could project out, you know, 20 years from now and, you know, this page is just full and full of interviews, you know, what would be the ideal sort of situation for you if you were to, if you were sort of, you know, the next generation of Dr. Whalen and you started working on a book, what would you like to find when you came to this page about the East West Institute? John always used to have, hate to have me have the last word. Um, you know, it, it, projecting that far out is, is, I think I would like to have a sense of um, uh, uh, the uniqueness of the Institute, the accomplishments. Um, I would, uh, as someone said yesterday, it's not the end of the Institute, it's very much the beginning. And so um, I would love to see someone be able to to go into it and explore segments of history and find out what was different. Why were they talking in, in the 20 stories about the um, unique qualities, the way in which this was refreshing, and while they didn't think it would last, what were the answers to the questions as to why the Institute lasted? And I know we're talking about oral histories, but John used to do at each of our board meetings uh, around the world roundup and presentation, and everyone would say, could you please send us a copy of that? We're also looking for documents. Um, we hope that the that what was turned over from the institute will be, a, and I know it's very comprehensive, but you may have articles, you may have, you know, we did a banking study on Russia uh, and that was uh, just earth shattering. Um, we did a Raguzzi on the underground cables study that transformed um, and brought together new networks for that. So it's not only just the oral histories, and we, Emily can do this anywhere, you don't have to be on campus to do that. Uh, but um, uh, I think I would like to know that those tools were there so I could see a comprehensive picture of what the Institute did and then drill down to some of the success stories of individuals, um, the other side of diplomacy, the fun stories of it, uh, and it's a comprehensive place to search how did this um, work and how can we replicate it? Thank you. Well, I think uh, it, we have some time for questions. Uh, so if uh, you would like to ask a question of anyone on the panel or ask about the, the history project, we're happy to try to answer them. Got Bruce back here. Thanks, thanks, John and Karen and Emily. Uh, I just want to uh, shout out to John uh, and his team uh, for what the great job they've done. I think you did a great job of explaining how. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, this was part of the uh, uh, negotiated uh, deal, uh, if you will, uh, which uh, Tim uh, helped uh, organize and everything. But this is a huge project, and just the level of energy and effort and, and professionalism you put into it really comes through, they're also maintaining the legacy EWI website. So if somebody you know, ends up going there and we'll transition that into this system eventually. So anyway, I just wanna say thanks. We sent down a whole bunch of disorganized stuff as you might imagine from EWI. And uh, so just the fact that you're able to sort through that and, and please feel free to let me know if, you're, if something's missing and I can go back and try and find it in the electronic versions of stuff. So anyway, thanks so much for Thank showing you. us this stuff. Thank you. I, I just want to be, be clear. Tim was very um, generous in his, his introduction of me. Is uh, One of the things that uh, I learned from my mentor and predecessor, David Cohen, was to hire really smart people and let them do their job. So at this point, <laughs> although I, I do have a you know, history in, in, in digital libraries, the team that we put up on uh, the screen are the ones who are really doing all of this work. And um, you know, it, it's... Uh, you know, they're very good at what they do. They're very excited to do it. And more importantly, um, I want to thank the, the Institute because, you know, what we are most excited about this is the opportunities for our students. For op you know, they're going to have the ability, I mean, just in this project alone, there are opportunities to work on in digital humanities, in global studies, in, um, you know, learning, you know, metadata and data management. There are you know, so many learning opportunities and you know, experiential you know, 
credit bearing, non credit bearing classes that they can do in this work, um, you know, we're excited about that. And they could do it in you know, some interesting things. Our catalogers, I went by and I was, um, now that they're speaking to me again, as we were really cracking the whip to get this stuff cataloged before the convening, um, you know, I would go by every day to get an update and drive them crazy. And it was, it was like looking in the news. I mean, they're publishing, you know, they have these stacks of publications on you know, the Ukraine and, glo and cybersecurity. Um, it was incredibly relevant material. Even some of it was published some time ago. But do we have another question? Modeler. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, two questions. Um, one, John, and, and I'll let you maybe wait to answer this till afterwards. Um, with all that you are doing, uh, you talk about the hardware, software, whatever that is necessary for this, and I know that we are putting an awful lot on you and, and the library with archiving. Um, records from the Huguenot Society of South Carolina as well. Um, so it's becoming a, a, a repository for um, not just EWI, but many things um, that happen in this country and in this world over hundreds of years. Um, so that question is, and I had left you a message a couple weeks ago, what do you need from a, um, from the standpoint of equipment uh, that would help transform this uh, into a better um, or more reliable, uh, deeper repository. John so that's need, one question. John the needs, is, um, yeah, John needs two more positions. He'll be taking checks at the door. <laughs> <laughs> Thread. Right, and, and that's, a very, that's a very important thing is, um, as with most institutions and certainly in South Carolina um, as a state institution, we do not have the, the depth of, um, of Harvard. You know, we're, we're not overly endowed the way many other places are. So for those of you who, who went to these Ivy League schools or, or other places that are overly endowed, um, think about sending your dollars someplace where they are um, more recognized um, because it makes a huge, huge difference to the College of Charleston. Um, the other, the question really that I have is, will our students be able, should they have the time to go through 20 years of, um, or 40 years of, of John, John's life and, and the way in which he approached um, all of this amazing um, way of, of bringing people's deepest secrets and deepest fears and deepest desires out. Uh, if they really study this, is this being put into a form in which they are able to essentially be taking a course in how to be a negotiator, how to be um, someone who can who can do this. You know, is that in itself sort of being set up um, as a course that they, you know, an independent study course that they can can pursue? Um, I, I just to your last question. I don't know. Yeah, I would have to defer to the uh, the dean of the culture, the School of um, Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs, uh, but, and his faculty on on the, the second question. But I uh, I can I can say yeah. one thing is one is that um, the the book manuscript that um, that we're finalizing and still working on put you know getting with the right publisher um, does contain sort of some distilled lessons about sort of how to approach you know the sort of John Roses and the East West Institute's approach to world history. So there are that we do have sort of some. Um, kind of sort of crystallized, uh, generalizable precepts, I would say, in, in the book manuscript. But uh, yeah, I'm, as far as the course goes, I can't speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll let, you know, Tim can answer the question as far as curriculum, but I, I will say, you know, one of the, 
So the magazine that we publish through our friends at the library at the college is called Discovery, you know, for a reason. And um, you know, that's really what the, the library is all about. And you know, we mentioned earlier the opportunities for students to engage in you know, faculty student research at a high level at the College of Charleston. And what our hope generally is, is that in doing that and being exposed to all kinds of different ideas and faculty across the curriculum, is that they will learn these lessons and discover them in a way that it sticks. You know, where there, it isn't so much about handing out a syllabus with a list of learn these five traits and you will be successful. Um, you know, we're, we're, um, if, if that were even possible, we would just hand everyone a copy of you know, how to win friends and influence people and a diploma and let them go. Um, but you know, we really want to embed that across the curriculum because the, you know, it's a process over four years, hopefully, um, to graduation uh, where you know, that's sort of embedded in the curriculum. But I know, Tim, the Leadership Institute has some really clear ideas about how it can accomplish that. Yes, we do. Um, and the thing to remember about the Global Leadership Institute, too, is this. It's not a closed system. It was never designed to be a closed system. When it was first envisioned and put into place, which was three years ago, this started being piloted before EWI contacted us. The goal was to synthesize international education across the college curriculum, no matter what students were doing. And we put, started to put in place and imagine a series of programs that would do that because students in the way the educational interest, industry works, students follow curricula and programming. Right? Now, our major area, Catherine, for doing what you do, for what you asked, is, is first of all, notice the way that John said student faculty research. This in, in our system, educational system, this always happens in teams. This is a mentoring exercise, and not just mentoring, though, we learn also from our students. I tell you, there is no place on the face of the earth that I'd rather be than a college or university campus. Because the learning that's going on and the creativity that's going on is just infectious. So we learn from them, too, in this process. But it's, it's a team thing. So you don't, we don't want to imagine, and I'm not saying you were, but we don't want to imagine students just out there just scribbling down notes from somebody. There's a template that John has developed that has to be followed and has to be implemented. And I had to learn it, too. <laughs> OK? And so yes, we've had our first workshop. And some students did attend. And that will be part of the process. Now, our major repository for credit in this regard is sitting in the middle of the back row, Malta Pale and International Studies, right? Because what, what Karen is talking about, here at the college, we refer to as global studies. And it's, a, it's an emphasis within international studies. And that's where the curriculum is broadened out. Okay? And yes, it does and will contain more on leadership emphasis okay? and what is being built out there. Okay? So it is ongoing. It is, um, you know, we always want to be pushing to become better in that regard. Okay? And, um, you know, there is a, Malta, can you, um, for a minute, we opened up global studies how many years, how many, when did we open up global studies as a concentration in international studies? So this Two? is, uh, this is our second year that we have a uh, global studies concentration, which is in addition to four regional concentrations that students can choose in the international studies major, which is sort of a unique uh, feature of our degree here in South Carolina. We're the only institution that does both. Um, thematic and disciplinary global studies alongside sort of an in-depth study of a particular world region within the international studies major. Um, I don't know uh, uh, if you believe it, but um, there are a number of things uh, that are unique about the international studies major. Among other things, we put out more international global studies graduates every year than institutions like uh, Penn State and other flagship institutions in the United States were in fact ranked the uh, 34th largest international studies major in the nation out of hundreds of institutions that actually 
uh, have this kind of major. And our students are really taking to this new concentration in global studies where they focus on themes um, and issues that are transnational that cross different regions and, and present global challenges um, alongside these older, uh, more established concentrations in, in regional studies. And we're uh, asking all of them to study abroad, um, to take language uh, for three years or more um, in the school. So we're, we're very proud of the graduates we're putting out and uh, we're hoping to add new coursework, maybe uh, we've loosely talked about ideas of maybe uh, starting a certificate program um, somewhere down the road between different units um, with international studies as an anchor. So we're definitely taking cues from these new initiatives uh, in the context of the Rose Institute to think and rethink about curriculum going forward that um, focus on applied, engaged learning alongside the more traditional classroom learning and, and weaving in ideas about programming, bringing in speakers, bringing in visiting fellows into our classrooms and giving students a, a more first-hand look at what people actually do once they graduate um, and, and enter this world of public service, of international business that um, uh, John Rose and, and the Rose Institute, uh, the East West Institute, excuse me, um, used to do and, and to inspire them to, to perhaps follow along those lines and start an international career. So what was your growth in the global studies? So we, um, uh, traditionally our students uh, choose the Europe concentration. It's partly because of the language background that they have, because they have to take language beyond the general education curriculum here at the college. Um, I think we're up to over 40 students in the global studies concentration, which is now the second largest concentration in the major. We have about 175 or so majors on campus, so it's one of the um, top 12 or 11. I think we're 11th largest major on campus. Um, so global studies is rapidly outpacing other regional uh, concentrations in terms of interest. That's not to say that they're not important. I do personally come from a regional studies area, studies background, so I think it's very important. But the students are really thinking um, much more globally, or many more students are thinking more globally now rather than studying a particular place. They're interested in particular questions, problems, issues that they want to tackle going forward. Yeah, Malta knows India really well. Yeah, South Asia among is others. Um, his German's also very good. <laughs> That's where I'm originally from, so <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> uh, that gives you an indication of where we are now. And just to add one more thing without taking up too much time and cutting off your questions, which are the most important thing here, is that uh, we, and the Global Leadership Institute has helped us with this. When we have international studies and our global studies, we're really looking at from the standpoint of where's the professional development at, okay, for these students. And EW, EWI and the Global Leadership Institute has already played a role in that. Um, several of you have volunteered for meeting with the students and becoming that, but also Bob Campbell. Are you here this morning, Bob? Over here. Over there. One of the first things that Bob did was put me in touch with one of his colleagues, Shelley Walters who is at the Osgood Center in DC. And he was a colleague of yours right at Austin College? Okay, long time friendship and colleagues. Well, it just so happens that Shelley is one of the best programmers um, running programs in terms of undergraduate professional development in this area. And we immediately started conversations with him and formulated an MOU with him so that every year, we have free to students on a application basis 25 slots for any one of his programs. Okay, that's just one example of upping the professional development for students. Of course, one of the programs that we imagined that was being put in place already when EWI came along was the Global Ambassadors. Um, you've met them, there is a cohort of 10 every year, it's now in its third iteration. Max Kovalov directs that, they meet with Max every every day, every week, and you saw some of them, and, and they, it's a big part of that program to put them in contact with practitioners, all right? So the professional development, or what we've branded in, in the educational industry is experiential learning, 
okay, is a big part of what, of what has to happen here for students, okay? The networking is a big deal. All of that has to go into place here, okay? So when I said on the first day, we've only really started to build out the programming, that's what I mean by it's not a closed system. It has to constantly be excelled, matured, because one thing I was taught early in my educational career is you don't want to underestimate who's sitting in your class. They're probably smarter than you are. <laughs> if you can't educate or help educate people that are smarter than you are, you better find a different career. Look, the next John Edwin Morose may be sitting in my classroom. Okay, what are we doing to help that kid? Okay, and that's part of, of course, the mission here. Any other questions that you have? Yes, go ahead. Our, Thank you for your comments. John, um, Matt Ross uh, served on the, the board of EWI over the last like seven years. Um, you've done a great job of starting uh, to uh, stop the digital rot, the, the loss of information as it ages through the system that you've put in place. But given that we probably do, after listening yesterday to the young ladies who led the discussion, have the next uh, uh, leader here, taking it beyond a stopping digital rot into the digital enrichment that um, where every student that is so much more adept at social media, at commenting, at video, than those of us of a certain age will ever be. Um, what technological resources do you need to capture the next 40 years of how these young people can share what did it mean to them in real time when they're experiencing it? And so what you do is vastly uh, digitally enrich it, not only through the oral histories of those that have been involved both from inside and outside the institute, but from the youth that are going to be able to express how did it impact their study? How did it bend the arc of their thought, of their action in a way? And, and that digital enrichment from those that are experiencing it, that is the next 40 years of the Global Leadership Institute. And so what resources do you need to go beyond establishing the platform um, to, to stop the digital rot and to take it into this digital enrichment that exists with the hearts and minds of so many youth here? So when we built the digital library, and Kathy, this will sort of answer the second half of, of your question as well. You know, one of the goals we had was to make something that was sustainable, that you know, we found many projects that had a grant or somebody fund it that was wonderful for four years and then gradually started you know, dying. So I wouldn't focus so much on the technology as the process, the commitment, and the staffing that we put behind it. You know, we, when we built the, the, what was the beta version of the Low Country Digital Library, which I'll sort of open that up now. Um, when we built the beta version of the Low Country Digital Library, we built the entire thing in Flash in 2008, and then the iPhone came out in 2009. And um, uh, so we stopped trying to predict the future and instead focused on a system where we had regular schedules of migration into sustainable platforms making sure that everything was interoperable across a number of systems that we tested in every browser, and that there is a you know, regular schedule of sort of migrating things so we don't end up with a, with a stack of um, you know, you know, WordPerfect 5.0 floppy disk that we can't read anymore. And we have, you know, so you know, that's sort of you know, how we, we built the system. When it comes to sort of moving forward, ideally what we want to be able to do is you know, allow students and people using the site to pull and copy, download and mix, and create you know, their own projects out of these, these interviews, of the documents, of the digital library work, um, and, and try to hold these things without restrictions. You know, the, you know, the best thing that we can do as a library is try to not be a mediator between the content and the people using it, but Oh. Their experience through that library. So many years ago, I knew that 
Right. So there really are no limits as to how you can allow people to do that except for how much server space we can afford. You know, I mean, that is the, that's, you know, I you said, you know, what we, we need. You know, it's the, at, at a certain level, no matter what institution you're talking about, um, you know, we can't just have everybody uploading everything that they have. Um, you know, we can't be Google Photos, right? I mean, we just don't have that capacity. So there has to be some level of curation involved and I think that's where having it tied into the curriculum and then when we talk about the legacy of the organization. You know, for me, the digital work is no different than the work that EWI has done for all these decades. It is about those personal connections between the people who are creating these things because sometimes we get excited about technology and put technology ahead of the people who are actually making it, um, which is how you end up with Facebook and rigged elections. Um, but, you know, and, and all of the debates about algorithms and how they manage it because it's all about the technology and not focusing on the people and the impact and the stories and all of these things. So, you know, for me, that's where we want to have this focus. I mean, Karen mentioned it earlier where she talks about wanting to preserve a community. And if you look at any of the literature written on sort of academic libraries over the last 30 years, you'll see that again and again is libraries are communities. They are not book repositories. They are not Google. They are communities of people who co collectively come together to engage in creative practices using the resources that are made available, the spaces made available, and the sort of human capital in investing in those things. So, you know, when people ask us sort of what we need, you know, our first, you know, the, the two things that I worry about are, are personnel, are people to do this work, to actually do the metadata work, it, you know, at least until AI gets good enough to do it for us, it still has to be done by a person. Um, and then also the ability to then link all of those things together and make them usable by as many people as we can. And then we also worry about sustainability. You know, it isn't so much of, well, you know, this year we need to buy some oral history equipment. You know, that's the, the idea of uh, sort of the, you know, oral historian in a backpack thing where you have a backpack with all the equipment you need and a student can check it out and they take it and then they can use it. It's easy enough to use where anyone can use it in a system that can be replicated. And that, I think, is how we have to have some controls there with the curation, and in a weird way, that system of checking out the equipment to go create the content and having a system in place that Tim mentioned of how they upload it provides just enough check where, you know, we hope to do that. I mean, we want to encourage people to be involved. We hope that the students who are doing the oral histories now stay involved. Um, you know, I mean, Tim was joking when he talked about sort of money, but the reality is that it, you know, the annual giving of them people who are devoted to the project you know, sort of keep every time a scanner breaks or we need a new recorder or we went from 4K to 8K cameras and we need a new camera. You know, those types of things tend to chip away at resources and take our focus away from the overall mission of the project, if that makes sense. You know, that, that for us is, you know, trying to keep those personal connections so that when the content is generated, because the other thing I don't think we want to do is get in the way of people's creativity of how they want to do it. You know, the, that is a recipe for disaster, I think, when you, you know, especially with our students. Tim mentioned, you know, they're, they're smarter than all of us. And, um, you know, that, I mean, it, it is quite humbling occasionally whenever we meet with some of these students and recognize that if we were on the job market and I was 22 again, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. Uh, so, uh, you know, that is, you know, so we, we want to create an open, interoperable system where they can participate and then encourage that participation between those connections. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we're going to have to move on, but Matt, this is a really interesting question. And remember, too, that the Institute has to sit within a larger housing, which is the School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs. And Matt, a big part of your question comes down to is this, is how well are we tracking and communicating with our own alumni, I mean, on a broader scale, so that we're coming back and including their stories as part of this as it builds, okay? And, and I have to tell you right now, tracking a graduate's a graduate of an institution is one of the hardest hunting jobs that you'll ever have. But we have found that right now, for right now, LinkedIn is one of the best ways of doing mm -hmm. that. Okay, so that's why we went with the LinkedIn platform here, but ultimately that's the larger housing that it has to sit in. So there's coffee back here. We can con please continue the conversation. These conversations are important to us and hear from you, and we'll see you again. Uh, back for the 11 o'clock session.